a lot of protection for a lot of vulnerable people, uh, and that has made a big, big difference. Now, what you haven't seen is widespread vaccination limiting waves. It's not just in the in Florida or the whole South. It's all across the world. You look at Israel. They're one of the most vaccinated countries on planet Earth. And they're having their biggest uh, wave of infections that they've had throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, obviously, Florida, other Sunbelt states, but even like Hawaii, very vaccinated. You know, we're the most vaccinated state in the sun in the southeast. Uh, and we've got over 85 percent of seniors fully vaccinated. Uh, but yet you see with this Delta variant, more contagious, very easy uh, to transmit. And it comes really in waves. And so as we're looking at that and say, OK, Vaccination is clearly helping reduce serious illness. It's reducing your likelihood of being hospitalized, uh, but you also have people who are being hospitalized. So, so what tools do you have that makes the most sense? And one of the things we've been talking about recently is doing monoclonal antibody treatments such as Regeneron. We've done that in um, different hospital systems have done it. They're doing it here in Northeast Florida. Uh, but it was something that the more we talked about it, the more people had questions. A lot of people had not even heard of it. And so we see an effort to be able to supplement that effort here in Northeast Florida and other parts of the state. We'll have additional announcements very soon, uh, partially to be able to get more people in. Uh, and we're going to bring in a lot more Regeneron into, into Florida, which I think is important, uh, but also just to raise awareness that this is something, this is the most effective treatment uh, that we've yet encountered for people who are actually infected uh, with, with COVID-19. And the way it works, I mean, the, the, the core group of people that benefit from this uh, are folks that are at the most high risk uh, for severe illness from COVID-19. So elderly people, people that have certain comorbidities, you know, kidney problems, uh, diabetes, morbid obesity, immu immunocompromised. Uh, this, if applied early and properly, has the ability to reduce your likelihood of being hospitalized uh, by 70% in clinical trials. And I think if you talk to people that have had it uh, in Florida, most people will say that if you do it early, it really does help to resolve the symptoms. And so what we're gonna be doing here today is uh, deploying a, a rapid response unit. Uh, this will start starting at noon. We'll be able to uh, deliver uh, Regeneron monoclonal antibody treatments to folks. The, the key to this is if you're in one of those high risk categories and you become COVID positive, doing it before the symptoms get very severe is when it's most likely to work. And so part of it is some people don't even know that this exists until they end up getting admitted to the hospital. And at that point, it's almost always too late for this to be effective. But part of it is just kind of a natural human instinct. Maybe you feel some symptoms, test positive, but you don't feel that bad. So you figure, hey, I'm going to clear this. If you're high risk, though, and it progresses, then you've missed your opportunity to have this be really effective. So that early treatment is really what the Regeneron and the monoclonal antibodies represent. So that's really what we're doing. So they're going to start by just taking referrals from the health systems here in Northeast Florida. But we are going to be moving to uh, allowing this to be done uh, on, on even an, an individual basis coming in uh, and making appointments. And we think that that's something that's very important. Clearly, this has now been, been employed uh, on an emergency use basis since uh, the end of last year. So we have a lot of time to have watched what's happened. And there's clear benefits to this early treatment for keeping people out of the hospital and reducing mortality. And this is also true whether you're vaccinated or not. I mean, obviously, if you're vaccinated, uh, we think the data in the hospital shows that your chance of being admitted and having a severe illness is less than if you weren't. Uh, but at the same time, we are seeing people testing positive in higher numbers than I think most people anticipated. And that's just not in Florida. That's really in places like Israel and other places around the world. So if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, if you're in those high risk groups, you can still do uh, the monoclonal antibody. The only thing, the only issue I think that doctors would tell you is if you're, if you're not vaccinated, high risk, you come in, you get infected, come in and get it, absolutely. You get the treatment. You have to ask the physician at what point in the future, if you do want to get vaccinated, do you have to wait because there's antibodies and they, they want that to be able to clear. But that's really, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, 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 only, the only major thing that, that you need to look at. So, 
who are the high risk groups that would most benefit from this? Obviously, elderly populations, uh, people with chronic kidney disease, diabetes, morbid obesity, cardiovascular, cr chronic lung disease, people with sickle cell. Uh, those are the folks that if infected with uh, COVID-19 may end up seeing significant consequences and could result, of course, in a hospital admission or worse. So if you do it early, this has a great chance to resolve uh, those symptoms short of you needing medical attention. And that's really, at the end of the day, uh, what it's all about. So uh, we wanna be able to do all we can to be able to do. Now, what we're gonna do is, so we have this here. This is helping uh, relieve some of the, the pressure because I know they're doing a lot in these health systems. Uh, so this is supplementing that and, and will expand as needed. And really it's just a matter of, you, know, you can do it through IV or you could do it subcutaneously. Uh, if you do it subcutaneously, it's easier to do. So you can probably get more people through if you have the appropriate setup. Uh, so we're gonna be expanding as much as we can and we may use other footprints uh, in Jacksonville. And then we're also looking beyond and throughout the state of Florida. There's websites, HHS has a website, for example, about where you can get monoclonals. The problem is if you go on it, some of these places, some of them have it, but they just aren't administering it. And, and others, others don't necessarily have it. So what we're looking at is, are there gaps in certain parts of Florida where we can bring some of these mobile units and then be able to offer this to folks uh, who get infected uh, in early treatment? And I think this is gonna be something that has just gotta become part of the standard uh, of care as you go forward. Uh, this is gonna be with us for a long time. I mean, I hear these politicians say they're gonna conquer it and end it. Um, you know, it's not gonna be eradicated as we've seen, you know, yes, different iterations. Um, you know, the vaccines obviously are helping people avoid severe outcomes, but you're gonna continue to have, have this, you know, go in the different patterns. So understand if you're in those risk groups that this is really something that you need to be thinking about if you end up with a positive test. So we're gonna be doing that. We're also gonna be doing strike teams to be able to bring it into nursing homes uh, when you have, if you have some nursing home infections. And we've seen that nursing home residents were some of the first people to be vaccinated. And I think you saw a huge decline in cases in nursing home residents, uh, but you are seeing you know, more of that now in different places. And so, so if you do have somebody test positive, obviously you can help that resident. You can also using, use it as prophylaxis. So if there's six other nursing home residents, maybe none of them have tested positive yet, you can go in and offer the Regeneron to them and that's proven to help them avoid infection entirely if you're able to get it early enough. And so we'll be using it for that as well. So really focusing on providing uh, early treatment for the most vulnerable uh, to keep them out of the hospital and ultimately to save lives is what we're gonna do. Remember, the sooner you do this, the greater the chances of success that you have. There've been a lot of people that have been helped by this, but I believe, I really believe that had more people known about this, uh, I think absolutely some of those folks uh, would not have ended up needed to get admitted to the hospital. So I want everybody to know that this is an important option that this is an important way to, to be able to protect yourself in the event that, that you are infected. And we're gonna be doing this in, in other parts of the state and obviously working with our long-term care residents who, who we've been working with from the beginning uh, to make sure that they're, um, that they're provided the, the type of protection uh, that, that we can. So I wanna thank uh, Mayor Curry for working with us um, you know, over these many weeks. And also wanna thank Kevin Guthrie, uh, Division of Emergency Management. He's been working with all the different systems about different stuff that they needed. So we're gonna hear from some of them um, and we look forward to being able to kick this thing off uh, here at 12 o'clock. So Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Governor. I uh, just want to say over the last year and a half, uh, we're grateful from when the virus was first with us and we had to rapidly expand testing. We didn't know what we were getting into, but we knew we needed it. You got it here. Jacksonville had tons of access to testing. Then when we got into the new year and the vaccines were rolling out, again, working with you and your team, we get our vaccines are readily have been and are readily accessible to our residents. And now this antibody treatment, as the governor said, is not well known by the community. It's effective, it works. I was on a call yesterday with all of the hospital CEOs in town uh, and we had this discussion. People need to know this exists. Uh, they need to know that this unit is here. If they uh, don't have access to their health care provider, Governor, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Hey, good morning, everyone. I uh, just want to again thank the Governor for his leadership on this, on this uh, 
breakthrough treatment, and I want to make sure that uh, everybody knows that this is this is a quintessential example of where local and state government work together very quickly to get something done. So again, uh, thank the city of Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Fire Rescue Department, the uh, Jacksonville Fire Rescue Department's emergency management team, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Emergency Response Unit uh, for getting all this set up overnight, and, and of course our vendors. So again, Governor, thank you very much for your leadership on that. Okay. Ken? Thank you, Governor. Hey, you tell, tell them a little bit about yourself today. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Ken Shepke. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Florida Division of Emergency Management. I'm board certified in emergency medicine and EMS. And so I want to thank the Governor for highlighting this very important therapeutic advancement. Unfortunately, I don't think the word has quite been out there enough for this very effective treatment. It's great for folks who are vaccinated but at high risk for progression uh, of disease. It's great for folks that are unvaccinated who, who get this disease. And it's great for folks who they're unvaccinated, they're not ill, but they've come in contact with a household contact of somebody who's gotten COVID. So as the governor reported, folks who are at high risk for progression to severe disease or death with, from COVID-19, this therapy can reduce your risk of hospitalization and death by 70%. And that unvaccinated household contacts of those folks can reduce their risk of developing COVID-19 by over 80%. So this is clearly one of the better therapeutics that we have out there, and I'm really appreciative to you, Governor, for, for getting the word out there because I think it's going to be very helpful for the state of Florida. Thank you. Great. And if you just – so the data, as, uh, as Ken said, the data is very strong. We have a, now a long runway where we've been able to, to do this. And, and that, obviously, the data trumps. I mean, but it's interesting just, just when you talk to people that have, that have done this, and there have been people that, that will get infected, they, they get hit, they test positive, they go get it, and then they'll say within 24 or 48 hours, they felt it was like a totally different ball game. Um, and what it is is when you get infected, you know, you, your body produces antibodies to then fight the virus, uh, and people who end up having an easy time with, with COVID usually do that fine, and, 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 they're, and they're great. Uh, folks who are in these higher risk categories, they sometimes don't produce uh, the type of antibodies that they need to be able to to combat the virus. And so what this does is it's an antibody cocktail. It's providing that. And then those antibodies get to work and really fight uh, against the virus. And I think that's why you've seen it's uh, people will say that everything is resolved within sometimes 24, 48 hours. I mean, that's a really, really big deal. And I think that Part of the reason it isn't as well known is because this was given emergency use authorization about the same time that the Pfizer and the Moderna were under EUA approved. So obviously people were looking at the, at the vaccines as a major thing, and rightfully so. Um, and so I think that this was something that even though the hospitals all embrace it, we work with them early on and said, do you need us to do anything? They're like, no, we, we have it. And, and most of them have been doing well here in Northeast Florida. I was at Tampa General. They do a lot. Uh, our sub, we think the supplementing them now will be helpful. But it was, it was there. Uh, but I think it was not something that was really publicized. And I don't know. I mean, maybe people thought that if you tell them there's a treatment, then they wouldn't necessarily get vaccinated. I don't think it's an either or. I think we know in a situation, you know, we have people in society that, that are not vaccinated. We also have people that are vaccinated who are still testing positive. And so either way, you know, if you get in that situation, particularly in these high-risk categories, this should be your stop. This is what you should be asking your doctor about and do this. We will probably, uh, the Surgeon General is uh, probably going to do a standing order, which will make our sites uh, available to people if they you know, meet the certain criteria. So they won't even necessarily need a prescription from a doctor because we'll have the standing order. So hopefully that'll make it easier for people and it'll increase access for folks going forward. So we, uh, this is just uh, one thing we're doing. We're gonna be doing more, uh, but I do think that this is probably the best thing that we can do uh, to reduce uh, the number of people that require hospitalization. With that, I can take some questions. Yes, ma'am. So just, yeah, just so if I can clarify, I was asked about respirators, which are actually different. And so, um, and, and, and we've never really had any hospitals ask about it. What they had been asking about, which I thought related to respirators, was there was oxygen deliveries on these trucks that they thought were coming behind. So there was actually things to do to do the weights and measures and all that. So there was not, to this day, any requests for respirators. The mechanical ventilators, we've been giving those out the whole time. Uh, and what that was was... It's just increasing our stockpile, uh, and that's why that's why they did it. So it wasn't anything that was like specifically from a hospital per se. It was something that they do through FEMA as a matter of course.
Well, I think the, the I mean, the staffing has been really the, the biggest issue that we've dealt with throughout the whole pandemic. I mean, if you recall, um, you saw really significant changes in how some of this is done. You've seen a lot of people go to contract. Uh, so they literally could have a job at a hospital, change jobs, work for a contracting agency, and then still do the same job at the hospital. They make a lot more money and it's a lot more expensive to do. So there's uh, definitely a, a war to try to get staff. I think it's been something that's been difficult. We have provided a, a lot of staff in the past uh, for that. Um, you know, but our, but our sense is, is that they, they deal with some of these agencies to try to bring people more in. That's just the situation that you're seeing um, all throughout the country. But there's no doubt it's not really a, a capacity issue as much as it is uh, the stress on the staff, you know, when you have higher volumes of patients. Yes, sir. So the answer is when, when President Trump did it, it was still an experimental, so it had not been emergency use. So the average person on the street in October of 2020 would not have been able to access it unless they were part of some type of trial or had different access. Once it got the emergency use authorization, it has been widely available. And so that's been done mostly through hospitals, now increasingly through doctor's offices. And I think part of the issue is there were, have been a lot of physicians, I think Ken would agree, there's a lot of physicians that didn't necessarily know about it, and some of the physicians weren't. More and more physicians are understanding it now, and it was just a type of thing where uh, I do think there was maybe people thought if you stress early treatment, then you were telling people that to not get back. It's not an either or. Um, now it's pretty clear, though, that uh, there was not as much knowledge. So I think it's less about access, but just about knowledge, because if somebody gets infected, what they're thinking is, okay, I don't necessarily feel that bad. I know I'm at risk, but you know, I'll just kind of ride it out. And that's what you normally would do on most illness. I totally get you, what you, if you, you don't expect to go to the hospital until you start to feel really ill. But on this, if you have those risks, if you can do it early, it really makes a difference. And so the access is there. We're able to do, um, we can place orders for 10,000 treatments at a time. And so we're gonna have you know, obviously, you have staffing and stuff that you have to make sure uh, they're going to work here to try to make as many people go through here as possible, uh, which will be really, really good. And the same thing as we go throughout the rest of the state. So access in terms of anybody, particularly if you're in those high risk categories, you absolutely are eligible for it. It's just a matter of making sure that your health systems are off offering it. Some clinics are doing it. Uh, and then we're now looking at saying, okay, we have some freestanding stuff that's already been going on where people have come in to get vaccinated, to get tested, whatever. Maybe we do a monoclonal and set it up uh, in conjunction with some of those other things. So I think you're going to start to see that. But since the EUA happened, it has been available for everyone. I think initially they had had it with a more limited age range, and then they've since dropped the age and so made it available to a wider group of people. But those really high-risk people, the elderly and some of those serious conditions, they have been available to them since the beginning. Yes, ma'am. Such as? Well, so I think the non-pharmaceutical interventions we've seen, uh, remember, we were promised that they would end the pandemic, lockdown, school closures, mandates, and it just hasn't done that. This is a very transmissible uh, virus. The, the last iteration last summer, you, someone got infected, they'd likely infect one or two other people. This one, they're infecting more than that. It's airborne, it's aerosolized, and so we just have to understand that when that's happening, these waves uh, are something that you have to deal with with prevent it with early treatment because it, you, we could sit there and say if we shut down schools no one would it would go away it won't that's not true it would be very damaging to society to do that and to our communities and so early treatment i think is probably the most effective thing you can do obviously if you if you're um, higher risk and you want to avoid certain situations you want to take personal mitigations 
by all means do that, but just understand with how contagious this is, and we're seeing these waves in other parts of the world, and you will see them in other parts of the United States as the season changes. The fact of the matter is there's going to be a baseline level of exposure to folks in the community, and so let's just make sure this is out there. Let's make sure people have opportunities to be able to do it. I can tell you it will absolutely make a difference in reducing the number of people going to hospital. But it doesn't mean you don't do some of the other stuff. I mean, I think if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you still do this if you're high risk and you get infected. But of course, the hospital census and you look, I mean, those are pretty, that's pretty strong data that we're seeing across Florida of the folks who tend to be admitted to hospitals now and how that's different from last summer, you know, when we didn't have the widespread vaccination of our elderly population. Yes, sir. Well, they might. Yeah. So I think I think the latter part's a good point. I mean, as we've seen, uh, we've had a, a, a wave of infection, but it has not been uniform in terms of when it really started. It started in northeast Florida before other parts of Florida. We think the indicators with the seven day moving average, as I mentioned the other day, you know, that's down for cases. RT value actually today, according to the Stanford and Yale models, down to 0.81, which is the, definitely the right direction, um, as well as the ED visits for CLI, which is uh, which is trended down as well. Uh, so 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 that those are good indicators. Um, and then some of the other parts of the state, uh, I think that it, the, the, the growth has slowed, but they may not have necessarily gotten past that. So we'll look at that. Uh, I think it's, it is a huge state, and I think that these, uh, these waves are not necessarily uniform in terms of how they do it. But I would just point out, I mean, you know, with like these daily cases, you know, those are reported publicly, you know, every day um, to the CDC. So people have access to that. Uh, but in terms of the uh, breaking it down by county, you know, that may not be a bad idea going forward. I know we used to look at that a lot. Clearly, you can follow where the, the hospital admissions, you know, have been. And if you look back to last summer's wave and compare different parts of the state, you know, here is the where in Northeast Florida, they've had the biggest increases over and above last summer compared to say Miami-Dade, which hasn't necessarily reached their, their hospital admission level that they had last summer. So those are important things to know. And obviously the community, you know, people should just be aware when, when you have higher prevalence, uh, it, whatever types of personal mitigations you wanna take, you obviously will be able to do it. So we're gonna look forward to having people come in today starting at noon. This is just the beginning. We're gonna be expanding this more. And as we go forward, you know, we're gonna see the, um, you know, the, the current wave you know, it's going to go. We're going to see that in, in, in the different parts of the Sun Belt, including Florida. But it's not going to go. COVID's not going to go away. We're going to have future, I think, uh, 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 trends. That's just natural. So the question is, is how are we going to approach it? You can approach it on the front end by protecting yourself. But of course, if you end up in a situation where you are infected and high risk, getting in here early, uh, this is the best, uh, the best shot we've got right now to keep people out of the hospital and keep them safe. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.